Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Great, great. So, so um, I'm going to be reading the, uh, there's three verses uh, for this morning's scriptures um, from Luke, John, and also in Acts. In Luke 9, 1, 2. And he called the 12, to, the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. John 6, 23, 24. Other boats from Tabaris came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Man, they just want to find him. They just want more, 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 um, you know, feed and inspiration from Jesus himself. They just went out and took off looking after him. So Acts 4, 29, 30. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you, you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Isn't that cool? All right. Take care, guys. It has been a while. I don't play for Cheryl. And she doesn't sing when I play. But today we will sing this, sing and play this beautiful uh, music called My Tribute. say thanks for all the things Jesus has done for me things so undeserved yet he came to prove your love for me voices of a million could not express my gratitude all oh, that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to thee to God be the glory to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done with his blood he has saved. Yeah. 
Don't they, don't they have power over you too? I listened to the tribute, and I wanted to say thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Rodrigo. Wow. The Lord has done great things in my life. I know what it's like to be without him, and that in comparison to being with him, it's transformative. It, is, it has brought me from the outside to be into the inside. And I get to be in his presence today. And that's if you've tried to figure out whether or not you belong, I'm here to tell you, you belong. You belong to Jesus Christ. You belong in his presence. And that is what we're going to be speaking today as we look into the the story in Acts chapter 3 at the gate. I was just recently in Hawaii this, uh, this last couple of weeks. Many of you know that uh, my wife and I had spent uh, 14 years actually living in Hawaii, uh, serving at the Central Church. And while we were in Hawaii, <clears throat> there were very famous people who had, they, they lived different places uh, on the island. And one of the one of the most uh, the one of the most famous people that we passed by on a regular basis because he lived on the trek to the beach where we, we was close to our house and we would walk there was actually uh, was actually uh, Gomer Pyle or Jim Neighbors. You know who that is. Um, he would sing wonderfully. He produced albums. He's not with us any longer, but. He lived behind this beautiful gate, and it was, it was back behind. You would see the gate. It was all made out of uh, copper, and the copper, you know, when it weathers, it turns the, tur the turquoise colors, and it was just beautiful, and it was all ornate with different um, palm branches and leaves, and, and I think there was bird of paradise on the gate itself, decorative gate, and we knew that Jim lived back there, but we also knew because of the gate, we didn't belong. The gate shut off the public, and I was public. We would walk by and know somewhere back behind that gate is Jim Neighbors. You know, I have to admit, um, when we were living in Hawaii, Jim Neighbors, I, I started to discover who he was and his giftedness and his talent. And he was just amazingly talented. His voice was extra special. He could sing. I saw him on the Carol Burnett show, not personally, but you know, you look back in the history and he's, a, he's on the Carol Burnett show and he was funny. He was tall. All the things that I would hope to be and things that I would try to strive for, you know, he represented and you're just like going, man, if I could, if I could just sing like him or if I could just act like him or if people thought I was funny like him, 
wow, then they would really like me. But he was behind the gate. This last week, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to our home stomping ground, and we drove down that familiar street to Cromwell's, that's what they called the beach, and the gate was open, fully open, and people were working on the inside. And though I know, I mean, the back of my mind, I know that Jim Neighbors, again, is not with us any longer. But because of the gate being open, all of a sudden, I felt like I was closer to this guy who, was, who made such an impact into the, the early years of television and things like that. I had a better connection because the gate was open. Isn't it wonderful? when the gate is open. I felt connected to him in some strange way. Is that Jim Neighbor's house? Yes, it is. Really? I could see it. It's right there. <laughs> Almost as if maybe it brought me closer to him in some way. And I wonder that, is it possible that when you go about living a Christian life, that it is our intention as Christians to leave the gate open for God. It is our purpose and intention that we are the ones who open the gate. Jesus Christ opened the gate, didn't he? Now think about it this way. If Jesus Christ opened the gate... The purpose is for the people who are on the outside to be close to him. That is the whole purpose. I invite you to look at the story of the gate and what happened. Peter and John had just experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, the tsunami that happened on the inside of the upper room and 3,000 people were baptized that very day. Many of you were here when we were preaching that just a couple of weeks ago. And all of a sudden, the entire church was, was transformed to being giving and to being uh, connected to one another and they were devoted to one another and they, they loved one another in a way that they had never experienced church to be like. And Peter and John, the two leaders at this time, they decided that it was time for them to go to the temple to pray. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon. And as they're walking along, they're talking about the different things that God was doing in their life. The power of the Holy Spirit, that just permeated their entire conversation. Everything that they talked about was, what is God going to do? I feel this, this intense passion that belongs to Christ for others. And so as they're walking to the temple, they get up to the gate, the beautiful gate, and they see this man who has been crippled since he was born. Scripture says he's been crippled for 40 years. 40 years without the ability to walk. Now, I'm going to let you know that without having the ability to walk, there are certain things that happened as a result. For 40 years, the man couldn't work and earn a living. For 40 years, the man couldn't go and worship. For 40 years, he was an outcast on the outside. And for 40 years or at least at the age of ascension, he was put outside the gate beautiful so that he could beg for money. Many of you are familiar what that, that feeling is like. I don't know if you've ever been aware, but has that ever happened to you where you're driving your car and you see the man with the cardboard sign or the woman with the cardboard sign and they are sitting in the middle of the intersection and you're driving up 
and literally the light turns red and you get caught right there and you know he's right there. He's got the cardboard sign and he's facing at you. We'll work for food. Donations accepted. I don't know, whatever the card might read on his sign. And I know, I know it happens to me. I know it happens to you. You got the 10 and two with your hand positions and you're looking down and you're trying to busy yourself because he, you know he's staring at you. Maybe you glance up slowly and you look at him and you say, these words, which often come out of my mouth, I only have credit cards. I don't have any cash. I don't have any food with me. And you're wondering if he's going to accept that. I imagine that this man who was standing on the side of the gate, on the outside of the temple, might have been calling out to Peter and John in a similar way, saying, will you please help? Peter and John, remember they had just been talking about the power of God, walking to the temple to pray at three o'clock, coming upon the man who has been broken since birth, and they look upon him, and they catch eyes intentionally with this person who has been broken since birth. And, he's, and Peter, he speaks up. You know, he's the one who, he's, he's just always the one who speaks up. Peter says, look at us. And the man responds and looks up and says, oh, I guess he's going to give me something. And these were the words that Peter says, hey, listen, I don't have any gold or silver to give you. I've got no alms to give you. But what I do have, I give to you for free. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Now, notice something, what happened when Peter of what Peter does. Peter reaches down to this crippled person and takes him by the right hand. So notice this. I have never reached out to somebody who I have said, hey, you and your infirmities have been healed. But Peter, knowing the power of the Holy Spirit, reaches down with intention that the Holy Spirit was going to raise this man up, takes him by the right hand and pulls him to his feet. And the scripture says immediately his legs were restored in full health and capacity. Immediately. Takes him by the hand and pulls him up in the air. And the man leaps and runs and jumps. Now, mind you, I wanted to just play this out just for a moment because it's important to realize when God does a miracle, he does a miracle in, that in the fullest capacity. This man has never leaped. He's never jumped. He's never walked about in his entire life. And yet his, he knows how to do this. Many of you have seen those natural, uh, National Geographic scenes where where you know the the animal is giving birth and then next thing you know this animal is running alongside they for some reason have the innate ability to do what their legs were intended to do that is the kind of miracle that god gave this man he immediately had the ability to leap to walk around and praise the Lord. Now, I want you to understand something because yes, this was a miracle, but he was still outside. When he received the miracle, the greater miracle happened. And that was he got to go inside. He ran into worship. 
as he was there collectively with Peter and John praising the Lord. Can you imagine what kind of praise that might have been? Now, we've had wonderful praise today, haven't we? Oh, I've just been fully, fully blessed. But I'm going to let you know, when praise happens to me personally, I am loud, I'm proud, I am, I am just praising the Lord, and I won't listen to any negativity because I can't, because I know what God has done for me. That's what happens when God starts to touch your life and transform your life in such a way as this cripple who had been there for 40 years was fully restored in Jesus Christ. Man, I'll tell you, that temple service at three o'clock was never the same. All of a sudden, people started to hear this commotion as if they've never heard commotion before. What's going on? There's so much noise. There's so much cheer. There's laughter. There's, there's excitement. I haven't seen excitement in the temple before. I haven't seen laughter in the temple before. I haven't seen excitement in the temple before. And they start coming around and they're looking at the guy who's causing all of this ruckus. And they're saying, well, who is this guy? It finally dawns on him, on them, that it was the guy who was at the gate from the outside. And they were wondering, and they were amazed, and they were just blown away that God would do such a thing. Well, I'm going to let you know, not everyone appreciated the miracle. Not everybody thought that this was a good thing. Peter started to share why it was able, why he was able to perform this miracle on behalf of Jesus Christ. And the religious folks who had already rejected Jesus demanded that they first be put into prison and then brought before court. This is the story that we are going to look at. And the reason why we're going to look at this story is because I believe wholeheartedly that God wants to do something amazing in every single one of his churches. God wants to perform miracles in every single one of his churches today. Now, here's the reality, is that when you start to think about how God is going to go about doing some miracles, I'm going to let you know that when God starts doing miracles in his churches, things start getting exciting. Things start running around. Things start leaping. It looks a little Pentecostal. And I am not suggesting that we go about being Pentecostal as we reflect on theological differences. I'm not suggesting that. But I am suggesting this, that we should be excited about Jesus. We should be excited about the way in which Jesus has healed us. We should never forget about how Jesus has given us strength has given us healing, has given us the ability to go in. That's why we are reflecting on Acts chapter 3. It reminds me of this old, this old book. Many of you are probably familiar with this old book if you've had children. The Berenstein Bears, Inside, Outside, and Upside Down. The story goes where this young bear gets into a box. When he's in the box, he has two little holes cut out for his eyes. And the mailman or the shipping guy, the shipping bear, comes to the house thinking it's a package to be delivered. Picks up the box and puts it onto the truck, only he puts it onto the truck upside down. Takes it outside from the house 
puts it on the truck, and now drives all over the place. And the bear inside the box is going all over town. While being inside, he's also outside, and he's also upside down. And I think that this is a perfect illustration for us to put these words in our minds about what it looks like when God changes the parameters of religion. Inside, outside, and upside down. Now, we've already read this before, but I want to el uh, elaborate what it meant to be on the outside. The man was found at the gate beautiful and as you can see on the gate over here to the to the right side the gate is also in the courtyard of the gentiles it was noticed that because he was lame because he could not walk then he must not be accepted by god this is the reason why the lame man was outside the temple it was because of the belief that being lame was a defilement against God's presence. This is not in scripture. This was contrived from scripture. In fact, we notice in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qunran uh, group, this was found in the first, um, the first rendition or the first receiving of the Qunran uh, studies. And this is what it says. No man smitten with any human uncleanness shall enter the assembly of God. No man smitten with any of them shall be confirmed in his office in the congregation. No man smitten in his flesh or paralyzed in his feet or hands or lame or blind or deaf or dumb or smitten in the flesh with a visible blemish. No old or towery man unable to stand still in the midst of the congregation none of these shall come to hold office among the congregation of the means of renown for the angels of holiness are or with their congregation talk about the kind of worship environment that these folks who were running the temple were trying to create it's almost as if they were trying to pr protect god from the very thing that God's purpose was designed for. They were trying to protect God from defilement. What Peter and John did about this person is he started to get involved in the life of the one who was outside. Now let that sink in just for a moment. Because I have said it before, I have said it again, I will say it until I'm old and gray, and I'm getting there closer and closer. The longer that you are religious, the longer that you are Christian, the statistics demonstrate that the longer that you are Christian or religious, the less uh, friends who are non-Christian you have. So if, what, what that means is this. If you only hang out with people who are Christian, then you're not going to have the opportunity to heal somebody at the gate. We need to be empowered by the Spirit to do what Peter and John did. When we see somebody who is in need, we need to call to them and inform them that they are to look at us. I'm going to let you know that that starts to look a little awkward when you start considering who you are as a Christian. Because I, I know the kinds of thoughts that go through my mind. If I'm demanding somebody to look at me, then I must have my act all together. But that's not what Peter did. He wasn't operating on his own behalf. He was operating on behalf of Jesus Christ. And let me let you know if you have any question. Jesus Christ has his act together. So when you say, 
to the one who is on the outside. Look at us. You are directing them to the one to look at. You are directing them to Christ Jesus. They took him by the hand, which basically means you're going to have to be close. How close do you have to be to take somebody by the hand? If my arm is three feet long and their arm is three feet long, is it not true that you have to be within three feet of somebody to take somebody by the hand? Now, granted, I understand that that goes against COVID protocols. I get it. Just keep your face six feet away. Does that make sense? Three feet and three feet? That's six feet. You can still touch somebody's life during COVID. Take them by the hand. And by all means, know that the power of God is intended to raise them up. By all means, know this. It is freely given. Remember, that's exactly what, what Peter told them. I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. But this is what I have, and I give it to you. It's free. It's free of charge. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you Jesus Christ. Transformative. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to try to qualify for it. It's because the outpouring of the Spirit of God is for you. And immediately, he was restored. <clears throat> I wrote this. I, actually, I did tell Brady I was going to share this. Brady um, worked at a summer camp. He spent long uh, years, actually. He's, he has seven years of experience working at summer camp. And one incident happened where we thought tragedy was going to be, uh, was going was to happen. Um, they were wrestling around, rolling, uh, playing some kind of uh, capture the flag, I think it was, yeah. And he collided with another camper. And it, it caught him in the thigh. Now, I don't think much of that. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of an uneducated medically guy. So I don't know how or why that would be dangerous. But apparently there is a syndrome called compartment syndrome where it will destroy the muscle. And that's exactly what happened to Brady when this happened. Thankfully, the nurse that they had a, that year was skilled and took him immediately to the hospital where it was diagnosed as compartment syndrome. Now, just to let you know, compartment syndrome is something that would cause you or very well could cause you without immediate um, immediate help, you could lose your leg completely because the muscle dies and then it starts to corrode and eat the other muscle around it. And that was what was going on. While he was there, they caught it in time. He was, um, he was able to keep his leg. But I remember vividly the time frame in which it took for him to wander around and try to get that leg starting to respond. In fact, it was just three weeks of lack of use that when the doctor or nurse had compared it to the other leg, the, the amount of muscle mass that was lost was so significant, I, I can't remember the, the degree, the amount of millimeters or centimeters or whatever that, that measurement was. But it was so significant that it surprised the doctor. And he immediately started to have to do physical therapy and to regain the muscle in that leg so that it would match the others so that he could use it. And what I find is, oh, let me just conclude the story, but he did it, everything's great, he walks around great, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, I mean, just like, phenomenal, he's, he's amazing, he's running and leaping and praising God, 
But I take, I tell you all of that story is because sometimes we force people to go through physical therapy to qualify to be with us. We force them to go about saying, hey, you're going to have to work up this muscle so that you can look like us. And I'm just going to let you know that Jesus restores them immediately. And when he's restoring them, they're functioning according to the way in which God designs them to function. It's too often when we go about allowing our idea of what perfection looks like to control the way God perfectly restores. I'm letting somebody write that down because I didn't plan saying that. However wretched may be the specimens of humanity that men spurn and turn aside from, they are not too low, too wretched for the notice and love of God. Christ longs to have a careworn, weary, oppressed human beings come to him. He longs to give them the light and joy and peace that are found nowhere else. The veriest sinners, you know what various means? It means there's a variety, right? All of the sinners and all of their variety of sins are the objects of Jesus's deep, earnest pity and love. He sends his Holy Spirit to yearn over them with tenderness, seeking to draw them to himself. I want to be people like that, don't you? I want to be the kinds of people that find people at the gate and, say, and says, look at us. Come on, let me take a hold of your hand. Let me raise you up. And let me make you a part of the community of God. Wow. Don't you want to be a part of that? Man, that's exciting. Because now we get to invite them onto the inside. I love this picture here where you have this guy who's jumping and leaping and praising God. Wow, what an what a amazing testimony of what God can do in somebody's life. And to be honest with you, what God can do in your life if you remember this is what happens when this man was restored fully. People took notice. People around took notice. He came inside, he's excited, and they all met and they surrounded him and they, they said, hey, what's going on here? This is the thing that caught my attention the most about this part of the scripture, though. The man clung to Peter and John. Now that's where it starts to get a little difficult. Because I am not the kind of touchy-feely guy that, that enjoys people to cling to me. I am the kind of guy that says, yes, you are restored. And now I'm going to go my way. You go your way. And, you know, maybe we'll do lunch sometime. Aren't, is there anybody else like that in, in, the, in the room here? Kind of like that? Yeah. But here it is where this man who was restored and, 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 and healed, he clung on to Peter and John. I think that this speaks to a testimony of how to maintain somebody in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Is it possible that God calls us to do similarly and allow the healed one to cling to you. What kind of adjustments would that make in your life? Would it be that you maybe need to change your schedule a little bit? I'm going to tell you, I had a, I had a young man when I was in Hawaii. Um, I had a young man who, um, he, he was on the spectrum, if you, if you know what I mean. He, um, he had a hard time socially, and he, um, for some reason, 
he got to liking me. I don't know why. I didn't think I gave him anything to like. But for some reason, he started to like me. And he would call me up about five times a week. He would call me and he would say, Pastor, Pastor, I'm so angry. And I would say, why are you angry? And he would say, oh, the people, they don't treat me nicely. And he would have this entire list of why he was so angry. And I would pray for him. Very next day, pastor, I'm so angry. I pray for him again. The very next day, it happened every single week, five days a week. And then on Friday evening for our studies, he would be there and we'd pray again. I was praying for him every single day for months over the same issue. And it tells me that when somebody clings to you, I need to make adjustments, don't I? I need to go about determining if the value of that person is worth the time of the investment. Does that make sense? And the only determination of, de of, of how you can value that person is in the imagination of how Christ values that person. And so it's this, it's this um, mental transfer of value from what God has done on that person's behalf in the cross of Jesus Christ, and then I get to be the bearer of that cross for that person on behalf of Christ. It, it's this, Ellen says it this way, Christ will impart to his messengers the same yearning love that he himself has in seeking for the lost. We are not merely to say, come. That's where I kind of stop. You know, come to church, come to church. You know, come be a part of the family. Come, 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 come. But all I am is a commercial. And let's face it, in today's society, people don't relate to commercials all that well. I have to admit that I look for opportunities to either delete commercials or fast forward through them. What she's saying here is this. If your message is just merely to say, come, 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 come be a part and all this kind of stuff, and you're just a commercial and you're not experiencing the love that God has for that lost, then they will not respond in kind. There are those who hear the call, but their ears are too dull to take in its meaning. Their eyes are too blind to see anything good in store for them. Many realize their great degradation. They say, I am not fit to be helped. Leave me alone. But the workers must not desist. Must not in tender pitying love, lay hold of the discouraged and helpless ones and give them your courage, your hope, your strength. By kindness, compel them to come. Of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire. That's what it looks like on the inside. Now, I don't want to move too, you know, too fast over how this plays out in our church. Because that basically means that when we start to connect with people who are on the outside, the way in which they make it to the inside is through the allowance of them to be close to you with Jesus's pity, compassion, and love. That's how it plays out. So it's kind of like this. As a church, we need to be able to be accepting of those who we bring. 
if I find somebody on the outside, you know, at the gate, beautiful, begging for whatever it might be, and I say, the Lord has grant you, granted you full, uh, full healing, full transformation, full, fully re restoration, and I allow them to cling to me as I enter this room with all of you, the question is, how will you respond to the one that I brought? That's a good question, isn't it? Because there are people in this room who wonder if I did that, would they be accepted? That is the very struggle of what religion versus Christian. That's the wrestling. Religion strives for perfection and protecting God. Christian strives for restoring people and bringing people in. Does that make sense? Now, many churches are only religious. But we need to be Christian. We need to turn upside down religion. I think that's what God wants to do. Peter and John were arrested. And just goes to show you that not everybody who uplifts Jesus Christ as the single only priority of their existence. Many religious people do not accept that. I'm just going to remind us, as Adventists in 1888, it was Wagner and Jones and Ellen White who made Jesus Christ the single most important aspect of our entire belief system. And what did it get them? Ellen was sent to Australia. And it wasn't a vacation, it was a mission. And I'll tell you, she did not want to go. She makes it very clear she did not want to go to Australia, but she went because she was sent by the religious. Wagner ended up in London, and he did not want to go, but he was sent by the religious. And Jones ended up in Florida. I'm not sure what is worse. If, if somebody is from Florida, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but my point is, they got separated because of religion. They were only sent because they prioritized Jesus Christ. They singled the sole purpose of our existence on the person of Jesus Christ. Our church has gone through this over and over and over again. It is an old story. Whether or not Jesus is the only reason why we exist, or whether Jesus is a part of the reason why we exist, if it's only a part of the reason why we exist, we tend to become more religious and seek out perfection in somehow trying to protect God from his purpose. When we uplift Jesus Christ as the sole reason for our existence, all of those things seem to just work itself out. Now, you know this to be true. How many, when was the last time you had Jesus, your single most important intention in all of your life? I'll tell you this. When Jesus is my single most purpose intention in all of my life, I don't think about the things that would be opposed to Jesus. Isn't that an interesting thing that happens? I just don't feel like doing sin 
the way I did sin when I was not prioritizing Jesus as the center. It's a strange reality, but yet people put others in prison for preaching the single, the single centrality aspect of Jesus Christ. Prison in all kinds of different ways. For Peter and John, they actually physically went to prison. For others, they end up in Australia and London and Florida. For others, currently, people write against them. They say all kinds of nasty things against those who put Jesus as the center. They say things like, they are not helping the church. They're bringing in all kinds of things opposed to the church. I've heard people give accusations about people who have put Jesus as the center, that they're bringing spiritualism into the church. I don't know how that those two piece together, but maybe they haven't experienced the spirit lately. And they put them into the prison of Facebook arguments and degrade their reputation. This is how Peter responded when brought before the court. By what power or by what name did you do this? That was the question the Sanhedrin asked. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice, maybe that's the source of spiritualism when they centralize Jesus as the number one. Those folks are filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people of the el and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that, the, that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, the very piece that holds it all together. That is Jesus. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Christ's servants are to follow his example, and he went from place to place. He comforted the suffering, the healed, the sick. Then he placed them before the great truths in regards to his kingdom. This is the work of his followers. As you relieve the sufferings of the body, you will find ways for ministering to the wants of the, of the soul. You will point to the uplifted Savior and tell of the love of the great physician who alone has the power to restore. This is the kind of man that I want to be. I want to be the kind of man where when I make Jesus Christ the center, the entire religious world gets turned upside down. And as a result, they start to take notice that I've been with Jesus. Because that's what happened here. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astounded and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Okay, so let's, let's make sense of all of this. Because I can preach, I can tell what the scripture says, but until it starts to make sense to you, all you're doing is sitting in a pew hoping that I stop talking. I'm going to give you an assignment. Now, when you take the assignment, God's going to be with you. And he's going to do some amazing things. Because there are people on the outside of the gate. There are people there. And you already know them. You know who's out there. I want you to go to them 
and I want you to tell them that they're restored in Jesus Christ fully and completely, and they, didn't, they don't have to jump through some crazy physical therapy hoops to qualify to, to be included. I want you to do that. Can you do that? Now, what happens is this. I want you to bring them to church. Okay, when you, when you find somebody, I want you to bring them in. And let's just all covenant to one another. We are not going to tear down anyone. Because anyone walking through the door has been touched by Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Therefore, we are bringing people because they are wanting to be in the presence of God. Therefore, we need to be the presence of God. So when you see somebody coming who you're, who you're thinking to yourself, what? How did, how did they? Jesus loves them too? What? Listen, yeah. The, co the cost of the cross was so full, was so valued that even the most sinful sinner is accepted by God. Bring them. Bring them here. Bring them. And let's turn religion upside down so that people will know that it's all about Jesus Christ. People will know it. The success of the gospel message does not depend upon learned speeches, eloquent testimonies, or deep arguments. So don't try to be practiced in how you talk and how you testify and how you can argue somebody qualified. That's not where the gospel message is. It depends upon the simplicity of the message and its adaptation to the souls that are hungering for the bread of life. What shall I do to be saved? This is the want of those who are on the outside. Let's bring them in. And let's turn religion upside down so that Christ can be lifted up. While Rodrigo is getting his guitar, I would like to invite everybody to please stand for a closing song, Standing on the Promises, hymn 518. Let's all sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. 
to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with his spirit sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. found us on the outside. You brought us inside. You have restored us in Jesus Christ. And now let it be that we are able to uplift Christ Jesus as our soul, uh, everything, that in your name, we might be able to transform those around us and bring them in as well. Now go with us today and let, this, let today just be amazing in your presence. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Greet one another and, and let people know that, that you love them. And Oh, no, I need to let you know. We do have an announcement. Next week is a very special day, Labor Day weekend. We're, we're doing a picnic together, and we would like to, during the picnic, after we eat together, that bring an instrument, bring an ukulele, bring a guitar, bring an accordion. I don't, it doesn't matter. We're going to have a sing-along at the outside and the, for the, uh, with the church. So let it be known next week we're eating together and we're singing together. Amen. Amen.